Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be talking about Skid Row, one of the biggest bands on the planet. Well, they used to be. Take a look at this. difference is night and day isn't it? Sadly in 2020 Skid Row are a different band with a different feel, a different sound and a different singer. They sadly have not remained as popular as the bands they once toured with but in 1989 to 1993 Skid Row were a top tier band selling out arenas all over the world. Skid Row toured alongside the likes of Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses. They took Pantera out on their first ever arena tour. They were the first hard rock band ever to legitimately have an album debut at number one on the Billboard charts. They even packed out the Point Depot, which was Dublin's biggest arena at the time. And just like Guns N' Roses did, Skid Row influenced a generation of youths and gave them a sense of belonging. Skid Row even inspired musicians to pursue the same style of music that they made. There are a ton of bands with the same style of music and image as Skid Row out there, so needless to say, everyone loves Skid Row. So why didn't they remain at the top of the pile? Well, to answer that, we have to start from the beginning of their story and work through it. To my knowledge, there is five eras of Skid Row. We got the Matt Fallon era, the Sebastian Bach era, the Johnny Solinger era, the extremely short-lived Tony Harnell era, and the current era I call Skid Force. I call it that because the singer of Dragon Force fronts the band, and he has such a weird name I keep forgetting how to pronounce it properly, but I digress. Skid Row formed in 1986 in a place called New Jersey, the same place Bon Jovi is from. We had Dave the Snake Sabo on guitar, Scotty Hill on lead guitar, Rachel Bolan on bass, Rob Afuso on drums, and Matt Fallon on vocals. But for whatever reason, it was decided that Matt was not the right fit for Skid Row. Although I have to say, I really love the early Skid Row demos with his vocals. He was a great singer. And it's interesting to hear songs like 18 and Life and Youth Gone Wild being sang in a different way. When Matt and Skid Row parted ways, Skid Row began looking for a new singer. A guy named Sebastian Bach, who fronted a band called Madam X at the time, had already been making waves on the music scene and was already quite well known and sought after by artists like Steve Stevens. A certain chain of events led up to Sebastian joining Skid Row. The first seed was planted when Sebastian encountered Nikki Six backstage at a Motley Crue concert after a show. Sebastian convinced Nikki to pass on his demos and a photo of himself to their manager Doc McGee, who also happened to manage Bon Jovi. Dave the Snake and John Bon Jovi just happened to be good friends with each other, and John was hellbent on making his friends band famous as well. The next seed was rock photographer Mark Weiss. Mark was getting married, and there was a ton of rock royalty invited to this wedding, including Madame X. Madame X had split up by this point, but attended the wedding together anyway. Sebastian ended up performing at this wedding alongside a young Zach Wilde, which impressed the parents of John Bon Jovi, who were at this wedding. Bon Jovi's parents told Sebastian about Skid Row and how they were looking for a singer, 
and how they thought he would be a perfect fit for Skid Row, which led Sebastian to audition for and eventually join Skid Row as their new frontman. Matt Fallon was good, but Sebastian was in a league of his own with a vocal range that very few could match. Sebastian had a high register and perfect vibrato. The emotions of songs like 18 and Life and I Remember You were perfectly conveyed through Sebastian's method of vocal melody, far outranking the abilities of Matt Fallon. Sebastian tweaked these songs to better perfect and suit his own vocal abilities. Doc McGee would eventually come into the picture and sign Skid Row to a management deal and John Bon Jovi would take Skid Row out on their first ever arena tour. Skid Row would officially release their first self-titled album in January 1989. There were four music videos made to promote this album and those were released over the course of two years. One for Youth Gone Wild, one for 18 and Life, one for Peace of Me and one for I Remember You. Youth Gone Wild became the most requested video on Dial MTV. Dial MTV was a show at the time where fans could call in and request their favourite music video that was in the charts, and Skid Row dominated it. 18 and Life became a top 5 gold single on the Billboard charts. I Remember You became the number one prom song of 1990 in America and the album itself sold over 6 million copies in the USA and 10 million worldwide. It went gold in LA Orange County alone, meaning that it sold over 500 copies in one county in one state. That's huge. It's one of the top selling albums in Atlantic Records history, right up there with Led Zeppelin's 4, ACDC's Back in Black and Foreigner's 4. Over the course of these two years, Skid Row would tour across America and around the world with Bon Jovi, Aerosmith and Motley Crue. They would be the first band to perform at the Moscow Peace Festival. This festival was a momentous occasion in Russia's history. Is this what I hear? Hey! The same as burrito and taco or fucking man whale well, and fucking whatever or something like that. I don't know what his name is. But, uh... See all the people out here. There are seven cop cars. It. Those are police cars. You want me to go outside and do some shots tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, no, I don't think that's a good idea. This is what happened. Give me after a camera, a fucking asshole with the bottle in my head. Show me the I already got it. You got it? And if this is ever on a home video or something, man. Fucking bullshit, don't ever do that because it's fucking bogus. Hi, I'm Kurt Loader, and this is the news at night. Today was Sebastian Bach Day up in Springfield, Massachusetts, or at least it was in Springfield's Camden County Hall of Justice, where the Skid Row singer was arraigned today on assault and mayhem charges that could, if proved in a trial, put him behind bars well into the next century, although that is a very remote prospect. Bach has been free on $10,000 bail since his arrest following a concert in Springfield on December 27th, at which Skid Row was opening up for Aerosmith. During Skid Row's set, the singer was struck by a bottle hurled from the audience, and he hurled it back, allegedly striking a 17-year-old girl in the crowd. Bach then leaped into the audience, allegedly landing on the girl and also kicking another fan in the chin. The girl sustained facial cuts and bruises, and Bach was apprehended in a car after the show by Massachusetts State Police. The name on the court docket read Sebastian Birk, but everyone knew who the defendant was. Metal's number one sex symbol, uncharacteristically decked out in a jacket and tie, was moved to an upstairs courtroom to avoid a crush of fans. But there were no smiles as he heard the full slate of charges against him. 
Two counts of assault and battery, two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and one count of mayhem. Box plea, not guilty to all charges, and an attorney would not say much more than that as they left the court. Today's so frontman Sebastian Bach became Rock's latest embarrassment this week when a picture of him wearing a t-shirt with the declaration AIDS kills fags dead appeared in Metal Edge magazine. When Skid Row pulled into New York City a few days later to shoot a video, we asked Bach to explain, and here's what he had to say. Okay, the thing with the AIDS shirt, okay, like, let's just, you know, okay, I'm gonna give my statement right here, it's an exclusive, here it is. The shirt that I was wearing, as you might know, says AIDS, it's the, it's like the, uh, Raid logo. It's the Raid, you know, Raid, <laughs> it's pretty harsh. <laughs> it's the Raid logo on a t-shirt, right? Only, instead, and you know on the Raid logo it says kills bugs dead underneath it. Well, this says AIDS kills fags dead. And I said, what's wrong with killing little bundles of wood? No, anyway, um, <laughs> um, nobody gets it, my jokes. A kid threw it up on stage, I put it on, and all these uh, people got mad at me, but let me just state this, here's my statement. I do not know, condone, comprehend, or understand homosexuality in any way, shape, form, or whatever size but I do understand that it is not cool to make fun of death and the loss of a personal friend or loved one is not funny in any way my grandma died of cancer and if some moron went around wearing a t-shirt that said cancer kills grandma's dead under it I'd be offended but I'd also think it's kind of a funny shirt but I would be offended so there's my statement thank you Mr. Sensitivity Sebastian Bach so yeah these two things happened and if they happened today, Skid Row's career would have been ended and their reputation irreparably damaged. While I don't condone this type of behaviour, I do take into consideration that it was simply a different time. Things like homosexuality was looked down on. Being gay was not considered normal back then. It wasn't considered cool either. And there was no such thing as political correctness. That word didn't really exist back then. Sebastian was barely 20 years old at the time, somewhat naive and sometimes ignorant to the seriousness of certain topics. And judging by his actions, it clearly looks like he wasn't given any sort of media training or taught how to handle getting attacked in a stadium. However, when he had time to reflect about the shirt, he had this to say. Let's talk about this age shirt, because I think mm -hmm. that's... Uh pissed a lot of people off or angered yeah. a lot of uh, AIDS oh, yeah, activists. What, what, was, what was going on there? You, were, you show up in a photo wearing a shirt that says AIDS kills fag. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, surely there's a story there. I mean, this is, this is, you know, it won't seem, you won't believe this probably, but at the time, I swear, I did not know that anybody gave a flying whatever what it said on my chest. You know what I mean? That was like the introduction into responsibility for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, actually, it really hit home because one of uh, one of my friends is a homosexual in New York, and a really, really good friend. Yeah. Um, and he just let me know exactly what it meant to him that shirt, and I felt like you know Fred Flintstone in Mr. Slate's office. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> shaking down in the chair. Or did he call you up and explain that? Like, no, nah, he really got bad. me backstage, and he was mad. Yeah. You know, and he had every right to be because a lot of his friends died, and that's not cool making fun of that. Yeah. You know. Where did the shirt come from? So I, it was thrown to me on stage. I, I didn't even know what it said. I put it on and said, uh, this sort of, you know. <laughs> so it doesn't represent your no. sympathies along No, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, there's nothing funny about death. I already no. said that. Do you think, that, you think things have maybe gone too far? And you, know you know what, you know what also nailed it, nailed it home was walking down a street and having a 12-year-old guy in a Skid Row shirt come up to me and goes, Hey, I hate faggots too! And I went, ah, wrong, you know. And as for the court case, there was a substantial cash settlement made to the victim. Sebastian was told never to contact the girl he hurt again, as it would be considered tampering with the witness. Despite this though, he has attempted to reach out over the years and apologise to the woman every chance he got, like in interviews and in his book. Sebastian also got arrested for inciting a riot while on the Bon Jovi tour. This particular incident took place in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Sebastian had just got done warming up his voice for the show and was making his way to the stage with a security guard. 
When they reached the gate, they asked the police standing guard to be let through. The police refused, as they thought Sebastian wasn't in the band. Despite being told multiple times by Sebastian, the security guard and the fans surrounding the area, the police still would not let Sebastian through. They then accused Sebastian of having vodka in the water bottle he was carrying. Then one of the policemen pulled out a stun gun and zapped Sebastian to the ground. It wasn't before Bon Jovi's crew came over to verify to the police that Sebastian was in fact the singer that they decided to let Sebastian through to the stage. Sebastian was angry from what had just happened to him. He decided to tell the crowd what the police had done to him. He then led the crowd of 20,000 people in a chant of fuck you directed right at the police. Sebastian was then arrested the minute he got off the stage and taken to jail and charged for inciting a riot. But this was just another normal day for Skid Row. These incidences only fueled Skid Row's popularity, giving Sebastian back the label of being the bad boy of rock and roll. As Skid Row was on the rise in popularity, it turned out that there was another Skid Row in my country, Irish Skid Row. Skid Row in Ireland was a 70s rock and blues band with members of Thin Lizzy before Thin Lizzy. Gary Moore and the rest of those members owned the name. Gary Moore would not let new Skid Row use the name unless they paid him a substantial fee. American Skid Row agreed to pay the fee to the tune of 35 grand. And that's where I'm going to leave this video. In the next video I'll be covering Slave to the Grind, Besides Ourselves and Subhuman Race. Thanks for watching guys.